Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, high time we had a conversation about sustainable energy. Well, yes, absolutely. Um, it's not like the first, but uh, this this is going to really intrigue our listeners. Um, I, I've come across a, um, a young man called Mark Powell, and uh, Mark runs a company, a sustainable energy company, called Island Pellet Stoves. Mark, welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you very much, Graham and Kevin. It's very nice to be here. Well, Mark, you, tell us where you, you're from. Uh, okay, well, uh, I'm born in West Wales. I'm from a farming background, uh, but my father's actually an engineer, but went into farming in the 60s. Um, uh, so, uh, and I went to school, university then in Cardiff, um, where I met my business partner um, at university. And we've been in business together since 1998, having having had various uh, different paths since then. I'm, I'm late 50s, I've uh, got three kids, uh a partner um yeah and uh we we have our we've got three businesses here in cardiff two well, of them I, are in the i got it right by saying you're a young man um so so basically you compared, than us anyway Greg. yeah i know that's what i'm gonna say i mean he it, is um is is like he's got in the first flush of youth um mm-hmm. but uh, anyway it's it's nice it's nice to have you here um mark but the business that you're running um is island pellet stoves it kind of gives away what you do in the title tell us a little bit more yeah so uh my business partner gabriel and i uh started the company back in 2010 um because we were looking around for pellet stoves uh for our own uh uses uh, doing up our houses and so on and we couldn't find anything that we liked and that's what got started on on the uh on the journey as it were yeah. What, what was it? What was the What was the problem at the time that you were seeing? Why didn't you like what was there? Okay. So, uh, so going just rewinding the clock a little bit. Uh, pellet stoves have been around since the eighties. They're they're from North America originally. I first came across them in Vancouver Island in about nineteen ninety ish. I was hugely impressed by them. Uh, I'd never I'd never seen an automated wood stove before that used this uh, refined fuel, uh, but they were incredibly noisy. Uh, that's the problem. But in North America, what I learned was that people put them in the basement and you sort of forget they've got basements where they have the pool table and the jukebox. So the noise isn't a factor. But we, of course, don't tend to have basements. We tend to put them in our lounges where <laughs> having noisy fans is a big issue. So um, it, it, the idea had been in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, and it was always a chicken and egg problem in the UK because the fuel wasn't available. Uh, so you can't have a stove that doesn't have the fuel. So the fuel has become available and is readily available now because the UK government brought in a grant scheme for commercial boilers called the Renewable Heat Incentive, which came in in about 2008. Um, and that's brought pelletized wood fuel onto the market. So there, there's now probably about half a dozen major manufacturers of the fuel in the UK. So in 2010, uh, Gabriel and I had the opportunity for various reasons to really start thinking about this stove. And um, yeah, so I went to see my local stove dealer. Who, who had uh, some Italian pellet stoves. Um, and as he said, he, he said, I've got, you know, Ferrari red, Lamborghini yellow. He said, but they're all filing cabinets, <laughs> you know, in terms of the shape. Yeah. And um, I said, well, what I'm looking for is a black box that will fit into my recess, just like my, the log stove I've got. Yeah. And he said, well, such a thing doesn't exist to his knowledge. So we started looking around and we identified that gap. And so we spent, um, in the end, about three years developing working prototypes. Right. Um, so you, what... you you found a problem, you you went away, and because you you're both sort of engineering um, people, you designed yes. the solution. Exactly, exactly. Um, took us a, took us a lot longer than we anticipated. We had a working prototype in about a year, but yes. um, the the issue was getting the emissions down and getting it through type testing, which took another two years before we really got that sorted out. Yeah. yeah. The, the the challenge that you faced was the UK an ingle nook can be quite large, can't they? I mean, they, these these can be quite sort of large spaces in which you can uh, put a, a stove. But um, the typical British fireplace is quite small, relatively, isn't it? It is. It is. And and the 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 filing cabinets that the the the, the um, stove dealer I was talking to was referring to is because most pellet stoves uh, on the market in Europe are made in Italy and Austria, and they don't have ingle nooks and recesses like we do. 
they have tend to have open plan houses and they just put it freestanding. So it's not an issue. But we we've got the oldest houses in Europe. They also tend to be the smallest. And as, as you say, I mean, there's enormous variation in uh, size of ingle nooks and recesses. But, yeah. you know, we were aiming for your classic sort of small British black box um, that would fit into, a, you know, a, a typical um, sort of recess, really. But did would you say, though, um, that the smaller it is, the less output is isn't that going to be one of the things on somebody's mind um yes to some extent that's true um but what we found was actually the constraining factor was the hopper size so the, these pellet stoves unlike a log stove you don't have to feed them every hour they have a hopper on board which keeps the machine working for typically eight ten hours maybe so it's no good having a small stove that only has an hour's worth of fuel because you, you've got the same problem as a log stove then you're having to tend to it so yeah. actually the the constraining factor was um, enough room to have a typical day's operation of fuel right so and and 10 hours um worth of a hopper is 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 that quite large i mean physically if you had to sort of... uh it, it's about 15 kilograms um oof, what's that about 20 liters if that's if that's meaningful um, well kevin's the expert when it comes to the mathematics not not, not that big a hopper for a day's worth yeah but no. mark Okay, I'm interested. I've got an ingle nook. It's a fake ingle nook, but on many occasions we've thought about putting a, some sort of st some sort of chimney in there and putting a real log fire in it. Up to now, it's been there for twenty plus years. It's had an electric fire in. At the moment, it's got a fake log stove. Um, why would I go for a, a pellet stove as opposed to a traditional log burner? Okay, so <laughs> um, well, there's lots of reasons, really. I mean, uh, as we all know, we're living in a, in a climate emergency. Um, that's what the scientists are telling us. So it's very important that fuel should be carbon neutral and sustainable. So that includes log burners as well as wood pellets. Uh, electricity is hugely expensive. Oil and gas are on their way out. They're fossil fuels. Um, but coming back to your original question about the logs, it's, it, in a word, it's convenience. A wood pellet stove is an automated machine. So it lights itself, it feeds itself, it modulates. In other words, the, the amount of fuel it feeds is regulated by a computer which is on board, so it, so it saves energy. Um, and it's about 20 to 30 times cleaner in terms of emissions. So the big, the big challenge in the wood stove industry right now is emissions particulates, particularly in, in urban areas. And wood pellet stoves are about 20 to 30 times cleaner in terms of what comes out of the, of the, uh, of the chimney compared to a log burner. What about cost then? No. I'm um, in the middle of the country, probably an area of where well, we see logging lorries going up and down the road every day. Logs are actually quite easy to come by in this part of the world. Would I be talking something that's that's much more expensive if I was going pellets? Uh, I'm not sure which part of the world you're in at the moment, Kevin, because you, 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 you're talking to me across the interweb. So I, I, yeah. I guess you might be. I guess you might not be in the UK, but. Uh... <laughs> He's in Northumberland. I'm in West Yorkshire. So basically, it, uh, I, I suppose we both have access to to to, to logs. But um, I think the essence of the question is that logs versus pellets. So um, so logs. Um, so as of about eighteen months ago, the UK government has clamped down on on where you can get your logs from because of the issues to do with uh, pollution, smoke. Mm -hmm. um, so now you're only allowed to buy what's called ready to burn logs, which are essentially artificially dried. Um, and they're typically about 30% more expensive than, than wood pellet fuel. And, um, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but that's sort of off the top of my mind. Well, uh, I do. Uh, I, do. I do. I do. I, 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 kiln dried logs, uh, 11 uh, and change, 11 pence per kilowatt hour. Wood pellets, 8 point, well, less than 8.5 pence per kilowatt hour. Big difference. Big difference, yes. Yeah, I think the um, as I say, you know, wood logs are not as natural as as you might suppose. They they have they've gone through a process to to dry them, um, and wood pellets are made from different material. Wood pellets made from sawdust, so that's a that's a, a cold product or a residue, if you like, or a byproduct from other operations. So all the wood pellets in the UK are they're not made from virgin trees. They're made from byproduct from a timber processing facility. So typically, uh, for example, the the biggest manufacturer that comes to mind. Um, are a large manufacturer of roof trusses. And every time they cut a roof truss, they're creating sawdust, and that gets converted into a wood panel. So, so it's essentially using a, a, what in the old days might have been called a waste. But uh, well, that's the point, isn't it? It's it. 
it's not just sort of it's called isn't it called biomass so it's in other words it would get thrown away mark in the in back in the day presumably back in the day it would have gone on a, a on a you know land, a landfill site but that's that's not the done thing these days and it's recycled it's reused um yes by i mean biomass is a cover all term that covers any form of organic material so that would include logs as well as pellet but people do tend to differentiate it's a little bit misleading really yeah um but yeah it, it's wood it, the, the the pellets that are used in our stoves are wood um from from sawdust from virgin sawdust and and they're like compressed together um so that you get these little pellets which are about i don't know uh, six millimeters long or something like that yeah, the, the, there's a there's a European standard, and the British standard still follows the European standard, the, the EN plus standard. They're typically six millimeters diameter, quarter inch diameter, yeah. and they're typically fifteen to twenty mil long. Right. And okay. as you rightly say, they're compressed. So the the process is you take the sawdust, it gets dried, and then it gets pushed through a sort of sausage making machine. It gets extruded in into that six millimeter yeah. uh, diameter. It's then cut to length with a with, with a machine. And then dried and stored. Uh, sorry, uh, allowed to cool and then stored. Yeah. So if I was thinking like Kevin, and I have been thinking um, uh, in the same way, Kevin, uh, if I was thinking of this as an alternative form of heating my home, um, I would have to think: well, where am I going to get the pellets from? Which you've kind of in indicated already that there are six uh, uh, main suppliers of, of them. And as, a, as I understand it, there are diff it's almost like there are different grades of pellets. Right at the top, there's your Leeds United. And towards the bottom, there's sort of, um, I don't know, um, Manchester United. You know, th that type of idea. So basically, you've kind of got the the, the, the pure the purebreds, and then you've kind of got the, the mongrels at the bottom. So it, it, is, is there a kind of um, uh, amount that you would buy at to make it an effective buy of pellets? You don't buy a little bag, do you? You would buy enough to be going on with. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, as, as someone once said, it's the law of bagging. You know, the, the price of a bag tends to tends to be inversely proportional to the amount you buy. So the more you buy at any one time, you'll get a better price. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, there are six main manufacturers. So UK producers of pellets, but there are umpteen importers bringing in pellets from, from Europe and North America and so on. Um, from a retail outlet point of view, it's very unlikely you'll come across pellets in your local B and Q yet. That that certainly is the case in North America and even in France and in Italy. That's the case. It's not the case here yet. So you typically buy online and you'd buy a winter's worth of fuel. You would you'd go online to the to let's say one of the UK producers and you'd buy a ton uh, yeah. of fuel, which would come in ten kilogram bags, which are very easily um, handled, yeah. um, and that would come on a standard Euro pallet. Uh, 1200 by 800 by about one and a half meters high and that that's your winter fuel and that would last uh with one of your stoves that would last for a winter typically yeah typically. yeah i mean obviously okay. it varies enormously depending on how well insulated the property is you know how yeah. many hours you're running it but typically yeah and if i understand it right that that pallet worth of of, of pellets even the uh the, i think they call them the a1 type pellets um those that would cost in the region of about 350 to 400 pounds that's correct yeah sorry in terms of your previous question with the grades so the, there are different grades as you say there's the a1 the a2 and i think there's even an a3 and that that relates to the ash content so the the diameter the length is fixed by the standard the durability is, is fixed um it's really the the um, the ash grade and that depends on how much bark um is in the is in the pellet so the bark obviously the outer part of the tree is where the minerals are absorbed from the ground as the tree grows and it's the minerals that create the ash. So A1 is the is the lowest ash level. Uh, A3 would be the highest. I see. So low ash presumably works through to a benefit uh, to the person using the stove because presumably if there's less ash, there's less cleanup. Absolutely right. Um, so typically with an A1 pellet, you're probably having to remove the ash from your stove maybe once a week. Hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit like the droppings of your of of the um of the toaster, Kevin. You know, it's not much that you could be having toast for the whole week. Thinking beyond the the just the stove sitting in the ingle nook, you know, that's going and hitting a in in our case that would be heating a room that's probably just used in the evening. Could you go on and and use a a stove to heat the entire house? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so we, we've done many jobs. So we have a product, the Lundy 8, which is called a, a back boiler stove or a boiler stove. And it, it roughly gives 50% of the heat into the room and 50% to a water circuit where you can pump that water from the boiler around radiators and underfloor heating and so on. And we've done many projects like that with the Lundy 8. For the right type of property, that could be the only source of, uh, of heating um, and hot water for that property. But this is a feasible replacement for an oil boiler. Yes, for the right property. Yeah, for the right property. I mean, the, the range that we have at the moment is quite small. So the, the, the boiler stove, the Lundy 8, is 8 kilowatt output. Um, and that's not really enough to give you a decent shower. So you would typically install a boiler stove with a hot water tank. Uh, sometimes it's called a thermal store, where you have a, a battery, essentially, of, of hot water, which mm -hmm. can be used to, to give you a decent flow of hot water for a shower. So the boiler tops up the battery. The battery then serves the, the shower, if you like. But, but if, yeah. you, if, you wanted, if you wanted a bath, though, uh, you, you'd, you'd be struggling, would you? Um, depends on the size of the thermal store that you can put in. Uh, we've done many jobs uh, that are hybrids, so you can install uh, in, in a, with the right plumbing configuration. You can install a boiler stove to work with your gas or oil boiler, so right. it's essentially to preheat the water that goes to your oil boiler. So, so you can use your oil boiler for topping up in a situation where the where the um, the pellet boiler stove couldn't couldn't cope. That becomes a question of mathematics, then, doesn't it? Um, because effectively, you're you're doing that because the overall cost. Uh, to the household reduces. Yes, absolutely. And if you've got a functioning, uh, let's say, oil boiler, we would never really advocate removing it. It's it's unnecessary cost. Uh, and there may be times where you you want to use oil. You know, if you if you want to keep the house warm over winter, maybe you're going away and you don't want to be running your pellet appliance because you know the hopper's limited to a day's worth. You might want to keep your oil boiler on just ticking over if you're away over Christmas for a fortnight. So we'd never advocate removing it. We'd always try to work with it. Um, to supplement it and it's it's really quite simple to to add these pellets to uh, to the uh, boiler isn't it uh, sorry i'm not sure Can well in a sense that you uh, the boiler sorry, try again the uh, stove itself um uh, has a lid that o opens up and and you can just pour in the the pellets it's really quite straightforward isn't it yeah it's very straightforward if you can lift as long as you can lift a 10 kilogram bag uh, then you, as you say, you open the hopper, which is typically at sort of waist height or chest height, depending on the model. Yeah. You pour the bag in, and and that's that's the job done for the day. So you you and uh, your uh, your partner uh, uh, Gabriel, he you basically came up with. Uh, you've got three stoves currently. You've mentioned one already, the Lundy Eight, which is a boiler um, uh, uh, related um, stove. What are the other two? So the, the Lundy 5 is the original stove we developed, which was for, which is designed to fit into your traditional British recess. So it's the, it's, the sh it's the smallest stove on the market. And that's just a five kilowatt uh, room heater yeah. uh, stove, if you like, um, which, is, which has the look and feel of a log stove and with the flame of a log stove, but it's an automated device that's self-feeding, self-lighting and self-controlling. Yeah. Um, and then more recently, we've launched the Ramsey, which is a six kilowatt stove. Uh, because it dawned on us quite late, quite late in the day that a lot of our customers um, actually don't have recesses. And if you're in a, a freestanding application, maybe something like a kitchen extension or a conservatory, where you don't have a, a recess, then you don't need to be constrained by the height. Yeah. So the, the Ramsey is a, is a taller, uh, slimline version that, that goes close to the wall um, and is ideal for those kind of applications. So, so the Italians had it half right then? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, to be fair, they did. they did. There's a few bits they didn't get right. Um, so <laughs> uh, to do with to do with flame quality and so on, which is yeah. uh, something it, it, we haven't really covered yet. But it's funny you mentioned flame, Mark. But I mean, the the, the flame itself um, isn't that one of the most attractive things to a potential purchaser. Um, so Gabriel and I, uh, when we developed the stove, we launched it in Harrogate in 2015 at the the trade show, the Hearth and Home exhibition. And uh, what what became absolutely apparent to us when we had all these stove dealers looking at the uh, looking at the Lundy is they're obsessed with flame quality. That's that's really all they care about. <laughs> um, we so, like a yeah. good fire in, in in Yorkshire, don't we? I mean, that's just you know. Of although they they probably come from all over the place, weren't they? They're so yeah. But, um, so we we got an award actually for our frame our flame at, at that show. But yes, you're quite right. So the frame, and going back to the Italians, what we found with the um, 
Italian stoves that we've looked at is they tend to have a flame like a Bunsen burner. It's a very short, fierce mm -hmm. flame that's um, not particularly attractive. And, and that's actually what took us all the time with our prototype was getting that flame right. So we've got a nice, lazy flame as you would have with a log stove, but one that's clean, mm -hmm. that meets the emissions requirements, but still has that uh, uh, attractiveness. So that's yeah. that's kind of one of our USPs. We've got a patent on that design. We've got a UK patent on that, um, on those features that allow that flame to be designed in that way. Um, yeah, so 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 in terms of the challenge getting it half right, we've we've sort of really focused on the flame. And the other aspect is the noise. I think I alluded earlier when I first saw these in North America, they're very noisy. You've got these fans blowing them out, and the Italians have the same. Um, we tend to have ours in smaller rooms uh, where we want to keep the noise to a minimum. So again, one of our design features is we don't use a fan. To push that I, I, I suppose the Italians just like shouting at each other, so they'll never notice it, will they? Let's face it. <laughs> but but we're we're, we're um, a, a little bit more, um, you know, we, we we like a bit of quiet. And I, I, going back to the flame for a minute, the, the understanding I have, Mark, is that when people watch the flame, it reduces their blood pressure. Oh, okay. Um... In in the sense that there's um, it's almost like it's just one of those things that I read in 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 preparation of of this uh, conversation, and, and it was. I was thinking, wow, isn't that one of the one of the reasons that people would actually want to buy? I mean, yeah, it's not the top of it, but at the end of the day, if you're going to relax in your living room, and you know, I mean, all right, if there's TVs on it, but there's a flame there that naturally just um, decompresses after a tough day. You know, I mean, like Kevin, he might have been adding up numbers for for goodness knows how long. And oh, this is, this is thursdays of years of evolution graham isn't it you know, you've you've been out hunting you've been out uh, you know, with your bow and arrow yeah shooting the deer to haul home for dinner yeah and uh, after that long hard day yeah you're just there in the cave staring at the fire yeah. oh, it's only last week for you though wasn't it oh, yeah. let's, let's face it I mean, that's, you, how live up here, that's, how you, that's how you live in northumberland but, but um, that, that's, that's, it, that's a theory of it graham surely that uh, you know, we, we've evolved for thousands and thousands and thousands of years of that way of living yeah and no i think it is I, officers, I, talking to pcs and things is is yeah. that in the terms of uh the human race is about the last two minutes well, that's true i i, I but it, it it's something to bear in mind and i'm sure it's something your flame reflects sorry uh, provides to your clients It'd be quite interesting to do a to do a uh, some sort of study of your clients and say do you feel less pre you know do you feel um le uh, more relaxed in front of the fire or not as, as a uh, well it's fascinating to listen to, to the pair of you there talking uh about the sort of psychology of fire, and I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot been written about that. It's not something I know a great deal. I have to confess. What I do know though is a lot of clients do tell us that their their dogs love it. Um, that seems to be the that seems to be the test that our clients use as to whether the flame is good or not. If yeah. the, if the if the dog is happy to lie in front of the stove, then all's well. Yeah. And and so far that's always been the case. So that's the sort of feedback I get. I've not I've not had so much um, insight from some of our human clients to that extent, but um, it, I suspect you. Going back to something you said earlier, in terms of it, um, when the w w when the it's it's a smokeless um, product that comes from the from the yeah. from the stove. When you've got a stove and maybe it's a bit older and you're burning wood, and it isn't um, smokeless, and you happen to be living in a smoke-free zone, then you've got a problem. Um. Uh, not not really i mean uh, in the context of our stoves um so we've uh, we've designed our stoves uh, following the what the i think the americans term the kiss principle keep it simple stupid so we don't use any sensors for adjusting any of the air supply to the stove everything is fixed so there's nothing that's going to drift over time so with our other businesses uh we're involved in commercial wood boilers where they're absolutely stuffed full of sensors oxygen sensors temperature sensors pressure sensors and they do drift. And you, you know, oxygen sensors are typically like the, the sensors you get in your car for your, for your diesel car, your, the lambda sensor it's called. And, and they drift over time. And when they drift, you the, the whole combustion conditions get um, changed. So from the very outset, we needed to keep it simple because nobody wants uh, a sensor to fail and then have to get a technician out there to fix something years down the line. So mm. our design is absolutely uh, fixed. It's all welded. There's literally nothing you can adjust. There's no dials, no nothing on it for you to fiddle with. 
So in fact, it isn't going to change over time. So as long as you're using that standardized pellet fuel, you know, mm. in other words, you're not using you know damp pellets or something, then there's no reason why anything will change over over the years. But the um, sorry, I suppose what I was driving at was the the experience that I believe that you've had with one of your clients who had a narrow boat in Teddington Lock, where he was in, encouraged to change his um, stove because it was chucking out lots of smoke uh, to the great and the good living up in their uh, apartment blocks. Uh, yes, sorry, I see, I see you again there. Yes, uh, so that was a client, as you say, living on a on a, a boat, uh, Teddington, and I think. When they first started living on the boat, it was literally a, um, a boat on the riverbank of the Thames, and then the Thames, uh, the riverbank got built around it <laughs> with all these uh, penthouse apartments. And um, what previous, you know, so the smoke coming out of his log burner as he had then was wafting up over the balconies, and he wasn't making himself uh, very, very endearing to his neighbours. So he came to us looking for a solution, and, and he's ultimately put the Lundy Eight in for his for his uh, his boat. Um, and yeah, and, and there's it's it's a smoke free experience. So, Mark, it, it seems that in a smoke-free zone, um, the range of your stoves um, is a great solution for people. Yeah, so the, uh, the smoke control area regulations under the Clean Air Act are, are regulated in the UK by DEFRA, Department for Environment and Food and Rural Affairs. Um, and they have a website with a list of approved appliances that have passed the tests that render them smokeless and therefore approved for use in smoke control areas. So I think right now, as, as we talk here today, our uh, range of stoves are the only ones approved for use in uh, these smoke control areas, which covers, uh, I would guess, probably about 60% of the population of the UK. Because they live in cities. Because they live in cities and even even uh, outside of the cities, the smoke control areas are, are defined uh, outside of cities as well. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Hear about a lot about biofuel, biomass fuel. Heard, heard about coal-fired power stations being converted to biomass. Is that the same sort of fuel that you're putting in your stoves, just on a bigger scale? It is. Uh, it is. Um, it's in principle, it's the same. Uh, it's a bigger diameter, I believe, that these coal-fired power stations use. Um, and I know there's a lot of environmental unease at what's being done with the coal-fired power stations to do with the sourcing of the biomass. So they use such vast amounts that they're coming in by boat from, I believe, in the main North America. Um, the fuel that's used in our stoves is, is homegrown fuel. It's coming from, as I said earlier, coming from co-product or byproduct from UK timber processing mm. uh, operations, and is sustainable. And that's, that's managed by an outfit called the Forestry Stewardship Council, the FSC. Uh, you'll see their logo on, on every bag of pellets that's sold. And that, that, that um that um body polices the sustainability credentials of those timber processing operations to ensure that the trees that are used for making these roof joists and so on these trees are renewed and are replanted and therefore the cycle the cycle of timber is is renewed and is um, and is essentially infinite mm. um and I, I i you know I, I don't know whether that's the case or not for these for these large coal-fired power stations i just i just don't know to be honest yeah. but it's a very different scale of operation is it infinite, though, Mark? We're talking about a waste product here that's coming from manufacture of other things. We're talking about sawdust. Is there not the case that if the idea of pelletized fuel catches on and becomes pretty big, and we have got bags of the stuff for sale in B&Q and so on, could the demand start to outstrip the supply? Uh, what I meant infinite, what I was getting at infinite in the sense of the cycle like going round and round, yeah. not necessarily the capacity. Mm. Um, Living in a rural absolutely... county that's full of these trees and we see areas of 30-year-old pine trees being felled and new ones being planted, absolutely get the cycle that's going on. Yeah, I think Does that, mean to, man... does that so, mean to say we need as... more trees then, Mark? Yes, it does. And uh, the UK is going through a massive tree planting program at the moment. We've got a historically low level of tree cover. Um, going back to the days of Nelson and his ships, uh, that's when the trees really started getting chopped down and for making charcoal for the Industrial Revolution. Mm. So we're, we're having to, you know, there's a massive tree planting program going at the moment to get that back up to sort of typically European average levels. But I think in the case of pellets, I mean, as long as man, uh, mankind is using timber for other applications, then there's always going to be sawdust. And there's more and more push for using timber for 
construction applications, but mm-hmm. prefabricated houses, for example, modular houses, get away from the use of concrete and steel, which are much more energy intensive. They've got higher embedded carbon, and those they use a lot more carbon in their construction. So timber as a material for these primary uses like roofing, housing, uh, furniture, obviously, um, is generating sawdust. And as long as that's happening, then they'll, they'll be sawdust. The, the, when I'm considering, um, and I being the, um, the buyer of a, of, a, of a stove, what are the things, if, if you, what would you expect them to be thinking of? I mean, I, I'd be thinking, will it efficiently heat my property? It, are, are there other things going through their minds in, in, in your experience? What are the things that, that they would be concerned about? I think, uh, as we've already discussed, I think flame, flame yeah. quality is one. Uh, yeah. Obviously, size, silence, reliability, uh, the look and the feel of it. Um, yeah. uh, you know, availability of fuel, storage of fuel. Have you got Have you got room to store maybe a ton of pellets? Yeah. Um, uh, as I say, that the you know you can't sort of pop down being human buy a bag at the moment. There are some plum centres that that you can do that. Yeah. Um, so I think those are the main the main sort of factors. I mean, a lot of people, you know, are concerned about what's going on with global warming and the climate and they want to switch away from fossil fuels so mm. there's a very compelling case there for for pellet stoves for that reason um yeah. for the for the carbon neutrality aspects and the convenience yeah i mean it i think it's i think you're ahead of the curve generally and and, and obviously if you're the only smoke-free zone uh, uh stove provider then by definition, you're ahead of the curve, um, but you've made it that way, haven't you? You you looked at the market um, a few years ago and then designed your own stoves for this market. So they're made in Britain. Actually, they're made in Wales, aren't they? They are. They're made uh, in Cardiff, in Wales. Yeah, where we're yeah. based. So yeah. you do you source the the metals that go into um, um, the stove from this country as well, or from Great Britain? Yes, we do. Yeah, they come from twenty miles down the road, just outside Port Talbot, uh, is our is our steel fabricator. Um, so yeah, it's all very local to us. And and so and then you do you offer some kind of uh, warranty with regard to the, if you like the just the just the stove itself. Yeah, so the main chassis we offer a five year warranty on it. It's it's fully welded. It's a very robust uh, bit of kit. It weighs about one hundred and ten kilos. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not put together with sort of screws and, and tin, tinny tinny thin steel. It's it's four mil thick steel that's welded. Um, so uh, yeah. In, in other words, it's built to last. I, I, built sorry, to- I, I, I've already got the Italians already. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to. I'll I'll leave my shovel to one side. I think well, yeah. we we started off Graham with Fiat, with Ferraris and Lamborghinis yeah, well, because I of the know. color of their. Yeah, units, but we've we've got to remember that their primary car is is Fiat, which, as we all know, stands for "Fix It Again Tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I actually really quite like the Italians, but having said that, um, maybe maybe their stoves are not quite right for us. But it's nice to have a British manufacturer. I mean, is that something you're proud of? Very proud, yeah, very proud. Um, as an as an engineer, I've spent probably half of my career working in manufacturing industry. Uh, I've, worked, I've worked for some world-class uh, manufacturing industries. Um, we regularly won Queen's Awards for exports. I used to work for a division of BOC making um, machinery for making silicon chips. Uh, we we had we exported ninety nine percent to the rest of the world. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love manufacturing. Um, I want I want to see it thrive in the UK, and we are very good at it. You know, the one thing that we really haven't touched on is one of the sort of uniquenesses of your boilers. And that's something called a balanced flue. Tell me a bit about that. Okay, so uh, balanced flue is not something we've invented. It's been around for a long time. Most of the gas boilers in the land use it. Um, it's a it's a flue design uh, whereby the um, the position at which the air that's used for burning, the position of that air inlet is the same as the position of the outlet for the exhaust gas. So that they're at one of the same position, whether it's at the top of the roof or on the side of the house. And what that means is that when the wind is blowing and creating pressure at the at the terminal, that pressure is applied equally to the inlet of the stove and the outlet of the stove. Uh, and that's where the term balance comes from, because it means that the, the pressures in the stove are balanced, they're equal, and therefore the wind has no effect 
on the efficiency of the stove, essentially. Um, that, that, that means... is... Sorry, Mark. That, that's interesting because you've got the standard old-fashioned log burner will have a, a chimney on it. Go up. Yes. Standard yes. gas boiler will be sitting on the wall, have the balance flue straight out the back of the boiler through the wall. Does that mean that you can now effectively make redundant having a chimney? Yes, it does, um, in the right circumstances. Um, technically, uh, with our stoves, you can terminate them horizontally um, through the side of the wall, as, as you're suggesting, as is commonly done with the gas boiler. There are some um, nuances to be observed. Uh, there are guidelines. You shouldn't be doing it if you're pointing it uh, you know, at your neighbour's front door, for example. Um, because while you won't see any smoke, you'll still smell wood burning because right. you know you are burning wood, just like with a gas boiler, you'll smell rotten eggs if you get close enough to it. So there are sort of nuisance considerations, but from a technical point of view, that's absolutely right. Um, but the main the main advantage, I think, of the balanced flue, um, as we use it on our stoves, is the chimney height. So with a conventional flue, you have to take the chimney very high, typically higher than the roof of the house, to make sure that, that uh, eddy currents from the wind and turbulence don't affect the chimney. And with a balanced flue, you don't have to worry about that. So you can get away with very short chimney heights. It's really interesting. So, so that's not that's not necessarily unique to you, but you you offer that balanced flue solution with all of your um, stoves. Yes, we do. It's, it's unique to us as a manufacturer of wood burning pellet stoves. We're the only manufacturer that does it, to my knowledge. Uh, but as, as Kevin rightly said, it's commonplace with with gas boilers yeah. and so on. Yeah. But um, yeah, we do it, and it's it's now pretty much standard. We we don't really sell um, stoves for conventional flue applications anymore, um, because apart from obviously the advantages that are inherent with the balanced flue in terms of the wind not affecting the the stove, you also get about a ten percent efficiency uplift because you're recovering a lot of the energy wasted up the chimney. It's used to preheat the air that's coming in for the burning. We, we're almost um, up in terms of our time here, but the, the one thing that's, uh, I mean, Kevin and I are both uh, keen football uh, fans, but you like a particular, um, um, you have a different sort of interest when you're outside of the stove world. Um, tell us a little bit about your your uh, your your past, pastime, shall we say. I thought you were going to dwell into rugby there for a minute, Graham. I thought, you were gonna, thought we were going to get into the Rugby World Cup and talk about... No, no, with, with its performance in the Rugby World Cup. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I follow the rugby like most Welsh Welshmen. But yeah, my I spend a lot of time walking. So Wales is a beautiful country, and uh, my partner and I spend a lot of time in the hills and in the west, walking the coastal path. We're working our way around the coast of Wales, um, and and you know, as you uh, particularly in the west, you come across lots of uh, stone monuments. Um, you know, the cromlechs and and so on. And, and that's a great interest to me. So I, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing is is looking at um, looking at stone circles and wondering what they were built for and um, where these people came from, what made them do what they did, and you know, why did they why did they build a stone circle in the middle of the Pacelli Hills of blue stone and then shift it 150 miles to to Salisbury Plain? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I tend to like to do. I mean, I think you're inc incurably curious, aren't you? I mean, one of the, is, is it is, is it just a factor of being an engineer that you you couldn't just walk on by when you you came across those uh, uh, stoves in the past? You and your and your pal Gabriel, you you just said, "No, we'll design our own." There must be something about you two that basically made you want to do that. I think we're probably just both pyromaniacs, really. I think uh, <laughs> I don't believe that. My, my, if you, my mother would say that from a young age, I always wanted to be a fireman because I thought they were the ones that went around starting the fires. <laughs> <laughs> I was very disappointed when I learned that they were the ones putting them out. Well, it, I mean, one of the things about your stoves is 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 that you just click it, don't you? It's it's, it's like a remote control. I mean, you just click click the thing, and then off it goes, and it it, it starts. Uh, that, yes, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. And then it's got timers on board as well. So it'll start itself, you know, early in the morning so that it's on when you come down in the morning, typically. And then it'll you know turn itself off automatically or, as you say, with a remote control. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very much uh, a sort of modern, modern experience, shall we say. Wow. Um, I this is Kevin, this is going to open the eyes of an awful lot of our listeners. And, uh, and, uh, and, and actually, because they, they've probably never heard of pellet stoves. 
And the, major, the vast majority of people just want to have been exposed. Now, where it might be of interest to are those people who are perhaps living in off-gas properties where they have a range of solutions that they can use for heating that we've discussed, but pellet stoves are obviously one of them. Yeah, and it's got me interested, Graham, because, uh, as I said earlier, we've got a fake Engelnook, which we've always had an electric fire in, and we've yeah. debated a number of occasions of, should we put a log-burning stove in? But that Engelnook doesn't have a chimney. So I'm intrigued by Mark's balanced flu idea, because that would seem to sort a problem out for us. Yeah. We're also off gas yeah. with an oil boiler that's 20 plus years old now. At some point, that oil boiler has got to be replaced. Now, I'm hearing lots of things in the media about um, down the road, oil perhaps not being available as a heating fuel mm. in terms of, of net zero. Mm. So, yeah, I'm very, very interested in what we've been talking about this morning. Well, on that bombshell, I, I, I um, and, uh, and, uh, and a, mass, a massive sales opportunity for you, Mark. Um, uh, no commission involved here, um, but um, but Kevin, I, I, I don't blame you. I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's an amazing product. Um, and um, uh, today, uh, Mark, you've been an absolutely first class guest on the Next One Hundred Days podcast. Thank you. We've got a, a very interesting product there. Definitely a green variant of the good old fashioned log burning stove. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it is it is a wood burning stove, but it's a wood pellet burning stove um, or stoves. And you, you have a choice of three stoves. And um, I, I, I really like the idea that it might even work for you, Kevin. It may well. But I think the thing that comes over to me yet again is that no, we we see green campaigners, we see the Just Stop Oil Brigade, we see governments talking about net zero and so on. All of it's just noise. The real answer to climate change, global warming, and so on, comes from small entrepreneurs like Mark actually doing practical stuff that makes a difference. Oh, I I one hundred percent agree with you. Uh, I I am. Um, I, we have to look at it in the round here that. You know, uh, Great Britain or the United Kingdom, our impact on global warming, so-called, is um, is minuscule. You know, when you've got China who are building coal uh, plants, um, you know, I don't know, is it thirty a week or something? They they're they're heavily investing in digging out coal, and yet we're busting a gut to effectively ruin the economy to, you know, do certain things um, quickly. It just seems it seems imbalanced, and and I just think um, that we need to have some. I think we move in this direction, and it's the right thing to do. But I, in terms of the speed and the velocity, I'm not convinced uh, about any date in the, uh, that that people set. Mm. Says the man who already owns an electric car. Yeah, but I did that for for again. It's it's self interest. I didn't do that to save the world because it won't save the world. Uh, and that, there's a lot of people who, who immediately told me, ah, but, you know, the, the, you, you've probably cost more of the world by that battery and all the stuff that goes in it. And I did it. That, that's me. the big problem with electric cars, Graham. It's the, if you, if you assume you replace mm. every vehicle on the road with an electric one and you have batteries in all of them, how big's the hole to dig out all the minerals to make the batteries? Well, again, it's it was more about a. I like the car anyway, but b. I I uh, there was a sort of a trigger that that, that I felt that the government was were going to go lunatic on in terms of um, 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 diesel and so forth, and and you know banning diesel cars and all that kind of stuff, which they probably still are going to do, but they but they haven't got a plan B, and and so for me, I I think I wanted to get ahead of the curve, understand how it was going to work. Um, and for me, most of my journeys are quite local. So it suits me down to the ground and it saves me money. Mm. And on so, that bombshell? Well, yeah, on, on that bombshell. But I do think from the uh, having Mark on the show today, uh, it perhaps opens your eyes to another form of heat in your home, particularly like you, Kevin, if you're in, not in an off gas situation and you've picked another type of fuel, like you say, um, oil or whatever, and um, here's something that might actually and should actually save you money. 
Indeed. Certainly so, and indeed. that's the bombshell. Uh, he is a Yorkshireman giving a Northumberland man uh, 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 a tip to save a load of money. Uh, 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 that is a Yorkshireman with Scottish roots, though, so he's bound well, to agree. spend money. <laughs> that's true. So on that bombshell, I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye.